Tonight's film is another one that is a classic in the truest sense of that word that we have not shown here. And it stars, for my money, not only one of the biggest and greatest movie stars of the 1940s and the 1950s, who has been, I, I think, uh, criminally underrated and forgotten, but it is a really a seminal film in the, in the noir canon. And so uh, I'm really, really grateful that not only do I get to show this film, I'm really glad that my dear friend, the actor, producer, and son of Alan Ladd, David Ladd, is here from New Mexico with us tonight, and we're gonna introduce the film. Welcome, David Ladd. You are a Palm Springs native going way back, and your, your, uh, your old house has a plaque in front of it. Uh, really? Yeah, it yeah. does. Uh, what was it like uh, in Palm Springs back when you were growing up for, for oh, our was, local it audience? Was, it was magic for a kid. I mean, uh, you know, I had a bicycle, and I, I would, you know, pedal into town and, and do all sorts of shenanigans and tricks on my bike, mm -hmm. and I, uh, I loved it. I loved it. We would. This was a second home for us, um, and you know we would come down here mostly on weekends. Mm -hmm. You know when I got into high school and college, and mm -hmm. we'd come down and wreak havoc, and and, mm -hmm. and uh, but it was great. <laughs> it was just wonderful. Yeah. Now, did did your dad did he own a hardware store here? Or? Okay. We had lived in Europe for a couple of years, and um, we came here in about 1955. They found a house that had the same address as our house in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and he couldn't resist. So, <laughs> so he bought the house, mm -hmm. and uh, it was, you know, and then he went to uh, the local hardware store here mm -hmm. and um, bought about $3,000 worth of stuff in 1955, which was a that lot was of a stuff. That was a lot of money. It was a lot of stuff. And he said, could you deliver that to, you know, he gave the address, and... Uh, they said, uh, I'm sorry, we don't deliver. He said, what do you mean you don't deliver? Then I'm going to go somewhere else. And he says, well, there is nowhere else. And so literally the next week, the contractor and, and he said, you know what? We're going to open our own hardware store. And they did. They opened a hardware store. And eventually uh, my father passed away, sadly. But uh, my mother kind of took it over. And it became the Allen Ladd hardware, and gift store. <laughs> you know, we, we carried everything from hardware, you know, basic hardware, to uh, Baccarat Crystal. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it, it, and it, I think it stayed open until 2007, and there was just nobody left in my family that kind of wanted to take it on. Right. So we let it go, and uh, sadly, because there were great, your, great memories there. Yeah, yeah. Now, your dad, he really came up uh, uh, the hard way. And uh, I know for a time, uh, wasn't he in like kind of the Grapes of Wrath type of camp? And he worked his way up. Uh, talk a little bit about how your dad well, got to Hollywood. He, they, he was born in Hot Springs, Arkansas. So they went from Hot Springs, Arkansas to Oklahoma City. Mm-hmm. And I guess it was during the Dust Bowl kind of days, and they ended up uh, staying in, 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 in Oklahoma City until he was 9 or 10. And then, you know, they piled everything on a car and drove out to Los Angeles. And they uh, went to one of those kind of camps, those tent cities, where my grandmother, who I never knew, um, ended up being the, the, the kind of camp cook. And they stayed there until she met someone uh, who was a house painter and finally moved out of there and moved into North Hollywood. Right. And he went proudly went to North Hollywood High, uh, which I think was called Lancashire High in, right. at the time. That was, when the, that was when North Hollywood was still called Lancashire. Yeah. yeah. And we, uh, you know, he, he went, went from there to, uh, uh, he, he was in a play called The Mikado. In, in in high school, and somebody from Universal said, geez, you know, this guy's pretty good. 
And they signed him, and they signed a whole class of people, including Tyrone Power. And within six months, they dropped both Dad and Tyrone Power. <laughs> and, and so he went to work kind of as, as a grip and as a, uh, doing anything he could to make a living uh, in the business until finally he got going in radio. In particular, was like a radio regular on something called the Lux Theater. The Lux Radio Theater. Lux Radio right, Theater. Right. That was big then. And coincidentally, my mother was listening. Now, my mother had been an actress. She had been a, a, a silent film star. She, you know, she did a lot of this. <laughs> but Your mother was Sue Carroll. Her name was Sue Carroll. Right. And uh, she, did, she did very well until talkies came in and... and uh, and that was kind of the end of her career. And she had to go to work. So somebody said, well, you should be an agent. You know everybody in Hollywood. So she became an agent. And she was the first kind of very successful female talent agent in the business. Mm -hmm. And along the way, she listened to the Lux Radio show and she heard this actor doing a, a part of aging from 18 to 80. And she thought, that guy's pretty good. I'd like to meet him. So she called the radio station, and in came my father. And uh, they talked for a while, and she, she said, you know, I'd like to represent you. And he said, no, 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 I'm not going to. I'm, I'm very happy in, in, in radio. I've tried this too long, uh, trying to be an actor, and it just hasn't worked. Radio paid big money back in those yeah, days. I, I mean, remember you know, Whit was, Whitmark he was, was in radio, and he came to Hollywood, and he said, I gave up more money. I'm coming yeah. here for less money. Well, he, he, um, he, he was reluctant to do it, but he thought my mother was cute. So he, he came back the next day and said, okay, we'll give it a try. Mm -hmm. And she just went to work, and she was tireless and relentless. The sweetest woman in the world. It's hard for me to believe that. Um, she was strong. She was strong. She yeah. was absolutely strong. And in particular, uh, was she got him to start working at RKO, which was like the sister lot to, to Paramount. Mm -hmm. But she had her eye on a movie at Paramount called This Gun for Hire. And she fought like hell to get him seen for that. And ultimately, he tested for it, and he got the role. And uh, Paramount at the time signed him to a long-term kind of contract. But, um, you know, he, he actually was now doing well at RKO and took half the money right. to do this role because kind of everybody knew, everybody being my mother and him. Actually, his, 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 uh, when you look at money nowadays and you go back and look at the production records for movies made in 1941, 1942, which, which I did in the, in the case of this movie, because I did a commentary track on the Blu-ray, uh, um, the whole movie cost about a half a million dollars. Yeah. And your dad got paid $4,200. Yeah. Yeah. But nevertheless, they, they recognized that it was a tremendous opportunity for him. Absolutely. And he got the role, and this was the movie that kind of catapulted him into stardom. Yeah. Now, this was based on a Graham Greene novel. Graham Greene. And uh, they, Paramount had bought it in like the 30s, and they had trouble getting it made for one reason or another. Part of it was censorship problems, all of that stuff. Uh, but they finally got a screenplay written by Albert Maltz, who mm -hmm. was a great screenwriter, one of the Hollywood Ten, and the great W.R. Burnett, who wrote The Asphalt Jungle, Little Caesar, all the way through up to The Great Escape. So very well written, very well cast. And since your father wasn't a star yet, this was supposed to be, this was his first picture with Veronica Lake. But the nominal stars, when you see the credit, are Veronica Lake and Robert Preston. Yeah, they were, this, they were without question the stars of the film. Right. And... Your, your father and Veronica Lake definitely had chemistry going on on screen, and they made subsequent movies, The Blue Dahlia, and they made Saigon. five or six five movies. Five or six together. movies. And they, were, they, they really had tremendous chemistry. And, right. And yet Veronica, uh, Veronica's mother, who was her manager, I hope I'm not offending anyone here, no. <laughs> but uh, couldn't stand... Um, my father, because it was 
it was uh, Veronica's film, and he was the one who kind of exploded out of it. Right, I think she was a great star. That, don't uh, don't yeah. misunderstand what I'm saying, but yeah. it was, you know, especially when you're a big star and and somebody else gets really noticed in in the film. It's uh, oh yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think your mother's um, support of your dad speaks for itself. One of these things I found in the production notes, dated five November, nineteen forty one. Sue Carroll is welcome on set when Alan Ladd is shooting, as long as she doesn't interfere with the production. <laughs> and that was after they, they kicked her out, which probably uh, the well, supposition it was Veronica Lake's mother. Yeah, I mean, Veronica Lake's mother was her manager, mm -hmm. and kind of everybody midway through shooting of, of the film mm -hmm. you know, could see what was happening, and so they... Uh, um, they you know, they, I, I guess my mother got blamed. How about that? But subsequent to that, they they went on and, and did the five or six movies right. uh, after that. And then years later, after uh, we, we had a, uh, or we, I say, my parents had a, a production company, and they tried to lure Veronica back into This was the Jaguar business. Productions yeah. at Warner Brothers, right? Yeah, and... Uh, and and she agreed to do it and then pulled out at the last minute. Right. You know, she had a very tragic end. She did. She, yeah. she was a troubled soul. And uh, But uh, she and your dad were really something on screen. And this, this movie is all shot in and around L.A. You see the train depot before Union Station was built. Uh, um, and then, of course, the, the, the famous L.A. gas company. Uh, how many movies have you seen with that big expanded metal tank in downtown L.A.? There's been so many film noirs there. And a great supporting cast of uh, Laird Cragar, uh, Tully Marshall in a wheelchair who was, I think he was in Intolerance in 1914. And he plays this kind of ersatz Rupert Murdoch after a tornado. And you instantly hate him because uh, uh, he's a bad guy. And, and former Palm Springs resident Mark Lawrence is, is in his and Mark's career. I remember I used to call him on the phone and I'd say, Mark, Mark, how are you? And he, his hearing by that time was gone. He was in his 90s and he'd say, who the hell is this? I said, it's Alan. It's Alan. I said, how are you? He says, how am I? I'm in Palm Springs. It's death's waiting room. It's 120 degrees. <laughs> but <laughs> Mark, Mark was the only guy who could talk about working with Allison Skipworth in W.C. Fields and also talk about working with Arnold Schwarzenegger. I mean, he had this incredible career. And uh, the, the, the movie, uh, when you watch it, there's one particular scene in a nightclub, and Veronica very cleverly does a magic act and a song, and, and it's very nice. And you'll see an establishing shot of a bunch of dancers, and if you look, you'll see a, a very, very young Yvonne De Carlo. Oh, is that right? In, in, this, in, this, in this scene. And uh, I, I, the thing that I like about the picture is this, it was made, I believe, in the summer of 41. So the whole war theme is very, very strong in this. That uh, there was a, certainly a good belief that the Japanese espionage, industrial espionage, all that, that, that uh, uh, it was clear that there were the good guys and there were the bad guys and, and who those people were. But your dad became such a star, I think people don't realize the amount of fan mail and what a big star he was by, like, the end of World War II. And, and how, did that, how did that change his life and, and ultimately your I, I life? I don't know. I wasn't alive. No, but I mean, <laughs> you, you no, came it, along it, later, but I mean, it, he, it, he, he was very a huge star. He was, you know, because he had had so much lack of success early in his career, he was, um, you know, he, he was so grateful to have this career and to have this family of people at Paramount Pictures. Right. We talked about this a little earlier. Uh, so much so that when the studio system broke down and he left Paramount, um, he was very insecure about it. You know, it, it was really, kind of untethered. Yeah, right. It was uh, it, so that that was, but it was it was amazing to see. You know, by the time that we got back uh, from Europe, you would see these people kind of filter through the house, whether it was the 
the prop man or the wardrobe supervisor, who, no matter who it was, mm-hmm. you know, this was his family. Right. And not being there was, was very damaging to him and to right. his psyche. Right. And, of course, uh, uh, with his first marriage, there was Alan Ladd Jr., yes. Laddie, who was one of the great producers of all time. He was a great producer, but yeah. he, was, uh, he ran companies. Uh, he ran uh, 20th Century Fox, and he had his own company called uh, The Lad Company. Right. And then he uh, moved over to MGM UA. But, um, you know, this guy, I, he didn't do much. He just greenlit <laughs> Star Wars and Alien and, uh, you know, made great, great movies. Won Chariots two, of Fire. Two, two Oscars, one for Chariots of Fire, one for Braveheart. And he sadly passed away last year, and that was very sad for me. Uh, we we worked together, and I loved him very much. So I remember when uh, we first and David and I have known each other for quite a while. In fact, he was one of my early interviews for the Michael Curtiz book based on the Proud Rebel, and um, uh, we become friends. And I remember at one point you said, "You know, we grew up in Hollywood, but we were all raised normally." <laughs> I mean, it, your your father didn't let stardom and all of that go to his head, particularly no. when it came to his kids. And my mother was amazing. You know, he, she mm-hmm. she really, you know, to to Alan, who's been in the Navy, you know, she ran a tight ship. <laughs> so, yeah, I did have the privilege of working with Michael Curtiz. And if you guys hadn't haven't received or read his book, uh, you should, because that <laughs> was you, one Dave. of that was. That was one of the great directors who, in in many cases, other than Alan's book, has been forgotten. You know, a man who made everything from Casablanca to Mildred Pierce to Yankee Doodle Dandy to uh, Robin Hood, Captain Blood. What am I missing? Uh, the Breaking Point, uh, Angels with Dirty Faces. I mean, just, uh, it, yeah, it goes on and on and on. Yeah, the uh, White Christmas. And what, yeah. <laughs> Really, make White Christmas and make Casablanca, I mean. Yeah. Well, my point was is that uh, he was forgotten. Uh, we, we, uh, we celebrate the 4th of July with Yankee Doodle Dandy. We celebrate Yuletide with White Christmas, and we fall in love every time we see Casablanca, but the guy that made these movies was forgotten yeah. or not known, and, just no. in anecdotes. But at right. any rate. But back to your, back to your dad, when you, when you look back at his career, uh, and his his stardom, uh, this particular movie, where does that rank on on your list as one of his well, signature performances? You know, the, I mean, obviously, Shane is is the one that he's most well known for and loved for. Um, number two for me was his version of The Great Gatsby, which you were here for, and we showed here some years ago. Yeah, that was great, and. Uh, you know, I, I personally love that film, and this is, you know, clearly this is in that group. Right. Um, this was the move, you know, the, the movie that made it all happen for mm-hmm. him. Yeah, and I have to tell you, the first time I saw this movie, and I, th- this isn't really a spoiler, but uh, I quickly figured out, I don't care how many people he kills, if he loves cats, he's close to my heart. <laughs> I mean, he was, he, that was a very, this is a very odd character to launch somebody's stardom. It, it is. It and is, this is, defines the anti-hero. Yeah, it does. And he played it so well because I think it's really difficult to take his character and get the audience to root for you. And he was able to do that with this role. And it just, it, it showed a depth of his acting uh, that I think in the future he didn't, he didn't get the depth of some of the role, the, the roles of Philip Raven. He was more of the, the classical leading man, which he did extremely well. But this was really a character-driven part. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. You, you know what? The star that he became, you won't recognize from in this film. Correct. Correct. So. Correct. So with that, David, I really appreciate you coming out here with Adida and your friends, and thanks for introducing this with us. Appreciate it. Put it together for David Ladd. Thank you.